Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with uh, Deep Space Updates for February 15th. I uh, hope you all had a great Valentine's Day. But yeah, we're going to start with the, the list of launches that have happened in the last week or so. So on the 10th of February, there was a Soyuz launch out of Kourou. This was carrying another bunch of OneWeb satellites for Ariane space. Um, that was successful. Later in the day, Astra was performing the Ilana 41 launch, their first launch of a rocket out of the Kennedy Space Center. And yeah, that didn't go according to plan. And I have a whole video where you can watch the failure in excruciating detail. Uh, and it really is. I'm sure it is excruciating for one of the university teams that had their satellite on this. Uh, on Sunday, literally during the Super Bowl, the is uh, India Space Research Organization launched their PSLV rocket carrying uh, the EOS-4 radar satellite. That's a synthetic aperture radar satellite that's in a sun-synchronous orbit that's going to be, you know, of course, doing investigating stuff on Earth. Uh, that was a successful launch. It carried a couple of extra satellites, um, Rydal, Rydshire payloads, uh, INS-2DT and InspireSat-1. And I'm sure those are great for the people involved. Uh, but yeah, this was literally during the Super Bowl. And I'm sort of tweeting this event, this launch, and also watching the hard hits in the game. Thankfully, there were no impacts on the uh, <laughs> on the ISRO stream. Uh, and yeah, this morning we had a Soyuz launch, or last night actually, Soyuz launched Progress MS-19 from Baikonur, carrying more payload, more uh, cargo to the International Space Station. But yeah, the big news yesterday that came out, in fact, probably the biggest news for, <laughs> would have been the biggest news, I think, if it wasn't for SpaceX's uh, you know, Starship update, was Polaris. So Polaris is like the sequel to Inspiration4. Again, it's a program involving Jared Eisman and his, um, his billions to let him fly in space. Again, not once, but like three times. And it's more like, you know, previously Inspiration4 was Jared and some cool people he picked and he found on the internet. This time it sounds like three missions with SpaceX astronauts and it's gonna be doing flight testing of SpaceX technologies, and he's going to be there. Uh, and so there's there's three missions that they've described. Well, actually, they've, they've talked about three missions, but they've only really described two. The first mission is going back into low Earth orbit and going into a higher orbit, likely an eccentric orbit, and also performing an EVA out of the front of the Dragon. The third launch is going to be a human, the first human flight test on board Starship. So we're not quite sure what the second launch is. And there's two things I think it could be. One is they could be taking a dragon around the moon like was previously talked. That would need like a Falcon Heavy. Or maybe they're taking a dragon capsule up and docking it to Starship because that would be a very useful thing to practice if there was a problem with the, you know, of course, step three where you were actually launching people on board Starship. But yeah, the first, coming back to the first mission, They've called it Polaris Dawn. And right away, the astronomy nerd in me says, well, wait a second, Polaris is the pole star. Therefore, it doesn't rise or set. So you can't have Polaris dawning. And then the space nerd in me also says, but wait, if you're in orbit around the Earth, then you will see Polaris rising as you cross the equator going north. Yeah, okay, so I did that to myself. Okay, so the astronauts in this flight are going to be Jared Eisenman, because he's footing a fair part of the bill. Um, and then three three people you might have seen in the Inspiration4 TV show Countdown. There's Sarah Gillis, who worked on crew training, Kid Petit, who was like the director, and Anna Menon, who I think she's in there, but I could be wrong. But she's an interesting one because her husband is Anil Menon, who just got selected in December to NASA's new group of astronauts. And if this uh, you know, Polaris mission stays on schedule, she's gonna fly before her husband to space, which is, I don't know, I'm sure they're both very excited, but you know, I wonder if there's some kind of race going on in the, the household. But yeah, this is gonna be a flight that's gonna involve an EVA. And since the Dragon spacecraft doesn't have an airlock and doesn't really have room to add one, uh, this is gonna require the entire cabin being depressurized. So for this, they're going to need a, like an upgraded EVA, an upgraded IVA suit. So the SpaceX suits 
look very nice. People think they look, you know, cool and stylish, but they're also really poorly designed for actually operating in space. So SpaceX is going to have to iterate and improve it, make it more flexible. We can't really tell very much from the artist concept. What we can see is that the suit has a gold reflective visor for the sunlight and you can see an umbilical connecting to I know, a wire. Um, so like there's things they'll have to do. For example, the suit that they currently fly with, when it is pressurized in an emergency, they use nitrogen and oxygen. And that doesn't work really for a spacesuit because the higher pressure in the suit, the less flexible it gets. So most spacesuits are pressurized by one third atmosphere, pure oxygen. And so if they convert the suit to that, that's probably right. It will probably mean the mission will need some uh, like atmosphere conditioning where they pre-breathe with pure oxygen, probably the entire crew, but maybe not. Uh, SpaceX suits have like no rotation in their wrists right now. The gloves are sort of sewn on directly. So there's no bearings here. They might need to do that to make it useful. They might not. The image doesn't show any backpack with like portable life support. And that might actually be precluded by the fact that they have to go through this very narrow space. The hatch on the front of the Dragon is actually too small for NASA's EMU uh, spacesuits to actually go through. I mean, they could probably fit, but like there's a limitation on what they're expected to operate through. And the international docking adapter is actually too narrow for astronauts wearing EMU spacesuits to traverse. So we might not see a backpack on this when it actually gets into space. And like the other thing about this is this Dragon capsule, sure, you're going to be able to get up to space and do an EVA, but you shouldn't think for a second that you're anywhere close to be able to doing the kind of missions the space shuttle did where they could rendezvous with Hubble and grab it and go out and do an EVA. They're a long way away from this. Um, but, you know, I think that as a mission, SpaceX would be very happy to do this. They really would be probably quite happy to show that they can operate the cabin depressurized. Uh, and, and NASA actually is also interested in uh, EVA suit. They've had a whole lot of problems procuring new EVA suits. And there looks like there's another round of you know bidding and jockeying to see who gets the, the rights. And this might actually help SpaceX a whole lot if they can say that they're you know, actually making a suit for an EVA that's actually gone out on EVA. I was thinking yesterday, like when have we had a new spacesuit? In the, right, it's been a very long time since we've had an actual new spacesuit that has actually been used in space. So like, yes, SpaceX's suits look very cool, but they've never actually been used in space, right? Because they're only there for emergencies, like when the cabin depressurizes, and that hasn't happened. So while I'm sure they work, They've never actually been used. So I figure out the last time a pressure suit, a new pressure suit was designed, made and used in a vacuum operationally was Alan Eustace's spacesuit that he used for his parachute jump. I think Felix Baumgartner, he also had a suit, but I think that's a derivation of a standard Dave Clark suit. So that would be like the only new suit in the 21st century that's a spacesuit that's actually operated in space. Like China had their have suits, but they're basically redesigned, like they're based on the Orlan spacesuit, for example. Anyway, I'm sort of getting distracted here. Um, the other part of this mission is launching the capsule into an orbit that brings it higher than Gemini. That's what they've actually said. And that's about 1300 kilometers, I think, apogee. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they're orbiting up at 1,300 kilometers. It means that they probably go down to a perigee of you know a few hundred kilometers and then go out to this distance. And that way, they still only need a limited amount of propellant to return. Now, to reach this orbit, uh, they're going to probably use the second stage of the Falcon 9, which means after launching, they're not going to follow the usual thing of dropping the second stage and then you know, inserting it to orbit. I think they're going to remain attached to the second stage until it comes around to the right position to boost it up. And picking that position is uh, is actually not a trivial thing because I think you want to make sure your perigee is close to where your re-entry would be for the standard recovery zones. And that means I think your perigee will be like over Mexico or maybe over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so that probably means like a complete orbit before they actually perform the, the orbit raising. 
I mean, and there's also other things that since they're going up high enough that they're going to be dipping in and out of the Van Allen belt, they might actually want to choose their uh, argument of perigee so that they minimize this in some way. But honestly, it's like they're talking five days. It's pr it's probably not a you know a game breaker as if you end up going the wrong way through the the Van Allen belts. Like they're bad, but they're only bad if you live there for weeks at a time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is a very exciting thing. Uh, it, it, they're going to do some science for sure, but it's all about Jared doing a spacewalk and really appreciating the world. Uh, they're also going to use Starlink communications via laser. So they, we might get a few more, uh, you know, like downlinks from it, which would be kind of cool. Um, yeah, and, and so we'll figure out what the next mission after that is. They say Q4 of 2022. That will be if everything goes perfectly according to plan. I won't be surprised if it slips out to 2023. Anyway, um, moving on to the rest of the news. So yeah, Lockheed, they, they announced that they are dropping their plans to acquire Aerojet Rocketdyne. And they literally announced this at the same time as the kickoff of the Super Bowl. It's like, please nobody look at this terrible business news. I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, hopefully Aerojet Rocketdyne are, are okay. I hope they don't get acquired by some like predatory private equity group that's just stripping them for their assets. Um, on the bright side for Lockheed, they did get selected by NASA to build the Mars Ascent vehicle for the Mars sample return mission. Now that Perseverance is collecting samples, that's the sort of next thing to actually get funded. Um, that's obviously, we're talking years away before that happens. That'll be a small two-stage rocket that gets landed. They'll have the payload put in it. It'll flip itself up and launch into orbit to meet a return vehicle. It's a very exciting mission, anyway. Uh, and uh, also, if you remember, I talked about a, a, sp a rocket stage, a spent rocket stage that was in heliocentric orbit, which was going to come back and hit the moon. And at the time, we thought it was the rocket stage from SpaceX that had launched the Discover mission. Well, uh, a week or so on and a bit more analysis, it turns out that no, it is in fact the third stage of a Chinese Long March 3C rocket, which actually uh, was used to test the return capsule for Chang'e 5. So that launched again several years ago and it's swung by the moon because the payload had to swing around the moon. And it's been, you know, dancing around and eventually has come back and it's going to hit the moon. Now, in terms of the size, it's actually surprisingly close to the size of Falcon 9. I actually originally thought it was much smaller because I just looked at the mass of the two stages. But I then realized, actually, the Long March stage is hydrogen. Therefore, the propellant mass is a whole lot lower. I think they're roughly comparable. Either way, it turns out that we don't have any seismometers or anything on the moon. So... It's not clear what kind of science we are going to get out of this impact. Um, but yeah, um, elsewhere in the solar system, going from close to the Earth to very far out, the New Horizons team announced that the, their names for several, for three important features on Arakoth have been accepted. So yeah, three years after their encounter in 20, January of 2019, uh, they've basically got names of surface features. Now, Arakoth is sort of translated or associated with the sky. So the names they've picked are all sky related. So literally the crater on the small lobe on the top in this picture is sky, which guess what is English for sky. Uh, <laughs> the neck region, which is highly reflective, is called Akasa, which means sky in Bengali and it's sort of, there's a bunch of other languages from the region that have similar words. And there's a circular feature on the larger lobe that's called Ka'an, and that's sky in the Yucatec Mayan language. I don't know any of this, I'm just reading this off the internet. Still, I think it's cool to have the features named on a rock on the farthest point of the solar system. Um, and looking out at things, the James Webb Space Telescope is getting ready to look out at things. And in fact, they, they did actually publish like some calibration imager, imagery, including this really cool selfie showing the mirror. You know, we said that we didn't have any engineering cameras. Turns out that we do. There's a way to like remove or add a mirror, I can't remember, to the optical train that 
removes a focusing step. So now instead of focusing at infinity, they can focus at the mirrors. And so you can see these things. This is very, very cool. And they're basically slowly working to bring these into alignment. They have a bunch of different star images. They've taken an image of like a, a single bright star with nothing nearby and they're, they're, they move these around, see the star wiggle and so they can now bring them down together one at a time. Uh, anyway, uh, Parker Solar Probe. All, they also did a cool thing because they, um, somebody noticed that in Parker Solar Probe images of Venus that they can actually see the surface of Venus. So Venus is covered in these really thick clouds. And, you know, when the Parker Solar Probe flew by, they were going to take all these images to see if they could get any interesting science out of the clouds. Turns out in the deep infrared, or in the near infrared, they can actually see the glow of the surface. So the surface of Venus is really, really hot and actually emits a faint red light. It's that hot. And they can see areas which are brighter and darker. The bright areas are actually the lower ones because the temperature is higher as you get lower down and the dark areas are the, the higher ones. So that's actually cool. They can actually detect something through the clouds. And yeah, since we're on the sun, I had the story last week of Starlink losing a bunch of satellites due to solar activity. You can watch that for more details. But yeah, that is that was relevant news for this week. NASA also published the first image from the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer that was launched back in December and it did that amazing power slide at the equator. So th this image is actually combined with imagery from Chandra, which is a much bigger telescope with much more, uh, you know, higher resolution and has spent a lot more time actually studying this. But yeah, you can see the, the cloud information. And you know, the great thing about XP is that it's going to be able to get high temporal resolution and polarimetry information. So that should transform this uh, beyond adding a sort of faint glow around it at some point. And uh, oh, yeah, on February 10th, NASA announced a selection of a couple of new mid-class or medium-class explorer missions um, that are both solar related. So there's the multi-slit solar explorer or MUSE, which is going to be a specialized space telescope looking at the transition region, essentially between the photosphere uh, through the chromosphere and up into the coronas coronasphere, right? So, you know, they're really wanting to see how the energy flows through this. The other one is a Helioswarm, which is going to be nine satellites that are going to swing out to orbits looking at areas beyond the moon. And what they're looking at is they're going to fly in formation and look at turbulence in the solar wind. So you need multiple, you know, multiple data points on this so you can actually tell how the solar wind is varying across space at sort of relatively small resolutions. So these are a couple of missions that are, you know, they're, they're about 200 and something million dollars each. They're obviously flying in the next few years. Both of them, by the way, are going to be based or operated out of the base Bay Area, uh, out of a facility at Lockheed, I think, and uh, at NASA Ames. So yeah, I think that is a pretty good roundup of the news and a whole lot of stuff about Polaris. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.